Welcome to the Blind Zone, where curiosity brings its own reward. And today, I was curious about my good friend and her job as an orientation and mobility specialist. And you'll hear why that's important. So first off, I'm going to introduce Patty, and then she's going to tell you how we met, and then I have some questions for her. So welcome, Patty, and uh, say a few things and how we met. All right. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, we met at Western Michigan University. Um, I actually started there in the O&M program, and then I also added on the TVI, the Teacher for the Visually Impaired program. And uh, I know we've been in some classes together, especially like the sports, because we got to ride bike together and uh, <laughs> do some different sporting uh, um, activities through those classes. So I know... Uh, I did move to Tennessee to to do my uh, internship for O and M, and then I came down to Texas uh, for my TVI. But probably get into that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we did because that's where I met you when I went back for my TVI, and we were in the summer the summer on site because because other than that, I was doing my stuff online, and so this Correct. is the six weeks intensive, and then. So I met you and Micah, a lot of people that were uh, in O&M at the time. So what got you, because now, now I have to say this right up front, Patty is probably the most organized person I've <laughs> ever met on the planet. And she's very, she's very considerate. She's very generous with her time. And when she cannot figure out a problem, she finds somebody who can help her solve it. Because I've, I've seen her go back and go back to professors and ask questions so that she can do her job to the best of her ability. So she, her skill level matches her personality and what she's chosen to do. So how did you first get interested in the blindness and low vision field? Uh, for just a little background, I worked at a full time as a parapro or a teacher's aide in a PPCD classroom for about five years. And they dropped my hours as a single mom. I really needed 40 hours a week. And they were going to drop my hours down to 32. So I asked the special ed director, do you have anything else in the district that I could do? And so she says, uh, she asked me, do you want to learn Braille? Sure. <laughs> so I, uh, I switched that following school year to another school in the district. But boy, I, uh, I learned Braille real fast. Uh, it was a totally uh, student with total blindness academic third grade and so I remember him brailing out a whole page and then I would have to interline it and put the print above the braille it, it took me forever even with my little cheat sheet and so that prompted me to uh take the intro to braille the free course at Hadley School for the Blind it's uh I just did it by by mail at the time they would send me uh, the lesson book, and then I had a braille at work, and so I'd braille my lessons, and then I would send it to my instructor, who was also blind, and she would correct it and send it back. So that's how I kind of got interested in in the blindness field. Um, from there, I stayed with that student for a couple of years. He moved out of district. I was like, oh, no, now what am I going to do? And so I pursued some more opportunities, and I ended up going to uh, a district about 20 minutes from, from home, uh, the district I was in was like five minutes away. And so I worked with another student with total blindness who was in kindergarten. And so uh, I stayed with her. I taught her Braille, the TBI, the teacher of the visually impaired, and the O&M specialist, orientation mobility specialist. They would come see her like twice a week. But I ended up reinforcing those O&M skills, the long cane travel skills, concepts. I taught her Braille. And so that really got me interested in, um, in pursuing my O&M and then eventually my VI, TVI degrees. Because I, I forgot I forgot that part of the story, the, the initial leg of it, because I know that when I was at Western and I had to learn Braille, it was the same thing. You had to Braille it out, mail it in, then they would correct it. But because that process took so long, I hired... Uh, somebody from the seedling book company in Livonia to come and proof my stuff so that I could braille it out correctly before I sent it in. And 
man, that was a lot of work. Braille's Braille still Braille's still tough. But you were really good at orientation and mobility. So I, I know that of the two, orientation and mobility, and, and maybe describe for, for our audience what orientation and mobility really is. Because it's when, when I tell people it's cane training, they just, because when they see me out with a cane, they think, oh, that's easy. But I handed that to somebody once and I said, this isn't easy, as easy as it looks. So describe that process, what exactly it is you teach when you're teaching orientation and mobility. Well, orientation is knowing where you are in space, and then mobility is actually moving. So a lot of it starts with the concepts, uh, your spatial awareness, where you are in space, um, your concept knowledge, uh, what's in front of you, what's behind you, what's next to you on either side. We do a lot with parallel and perpendicular, especially when you start crossing streets, even in a residential environment or a a large lighted, uh, complex lighted intersection. You got to know where your traffic is in relation to you. So you start with a lot of those concepts. And then sometimes I have low vision students now. They might use a monocular, which is like, instead of a binocular, which is two, you use a monocular. It's like a telescope. And they use that to read signs. A lot of students, maybe low vision, they can't read a sign across two lanes of of traffic. Um, And so we use a monocular to read street signs. They may or may not use a cane. It depends on their visual impairment. Uh, Sometimes my students have such good vision, usable vision, that they only use a long cane when they're crossing complex light intersections, like six lanes, five lanes of traffic. And they do that for for awareness, for their own safety, to make them more drivers see them better, um, keep them safer while they're crossing uh, all those all those streets. Um, sometimes my like, students have total blindness or very severe low vision, and yes, they will use a long cane. And so we teach them cane skills of how to go up and down stairs. How how do you use a cane if you go to the movie theater? They might want to go listen to a movie. Um, so they have descriptive movies. Maybe they just want to sit there with their friends and, and go listen to that. Maybe in church, they got to walk down a pew. So there's different cane techniques for different uh, areas of their travel. And so they learn those techniques. They may use, a, a, for instance, some canes, white canes, have a ball on the bottom, and we keep that constant contact that ball never leaves the surface it stays on the ground they get that feedback from that ball and if that ball your tip rolls off there might be a curb there or a stairs and so that's why we use the cane to protect them uh, to keep them more safe um, and more independent as they travel well so- and, and i'll tell you this as as a blind person i I didn't get that much orientation or mobility. In fact, uh, when I first became uh, blind, I had like three days worth of cane training and it wasn't near enough. And so then because, you know, I was married and David, uh, he was my seeing eye David. And so then once he died, I, I, I wished I would have paid better attention to what I could have learned with orientation and mobility because I'm, I'm, I'm still pretty skittish. And, and by now, you know, I've been blind since I won, so I should be well more advanced than I am. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and I'm not, and I, and I'm, you know, learning, I'm trying to get better at that. And everywhere I've moved, I've had an o and instructor come out and, and help me with that. So how did you, so of the two, the, the TBI, the teacher for visual impairment, the children, and the O&M, why did you lean more in that direction rather than the TVI? Because the TVI stuff is where you're, this is, this is my understanding because I did that for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. You're giving your student, you're leveling that playing field so that student has the same access to academics as sighted students. So you prepare things so that they can act, they can function as close to uh, other students in the classroom 
can can function. Would that be accurate? Yes, that's correct. Yep, you adapt materials, whether especially if they're uh, totally blind or very low vision, you want to adapt it so that they have that same access um, to the curriculum as other students. Mm -hmm. So yep. why O and M over TBI? Well, because I think, well, for one, TBI is a lot of paperwork, but you know, that, well, that's just yeah. me. TBI, uh, for the teacher of the vision impaired, you're in the classroom, you're teaching Braille, you're adapting materials, it's an academic more. And so the O&M drew me to it because it's very active. I love to be active, I love to be outside. Um, even here in Texas, when it's 100 degrees, I'll still take students out because they still need to learn to travel outside. Uh, we don't travel in snow and that here, but uh, we get the heat and stuff. But um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's the active part. I love to take students like on public transportation. I, I, I drive them up to San Antonio. We take the public bus they, and I'm going to be doing that in a couple of weeks to the student. It takes 40 minutes for us to get up there, but he needs, the student needs to learn how to access public transportation so that he, if he chooses to decide to, or he or she, I have other students, decide to go to college or move to the big city, uh, they have access to transportation. Um, they may or may not be drivers. I can't make that decision. But uh, it's the act of being out in the community. I go to parks. I go to grocery stores. We go to the library. I go to the hospital because the hospital has great departments to locate, um, especially the medical center. I've got elevators. I've got stairs. We can practice cane travel on stairs. So I take them everywhere. <laughs> And, uh, well, I well, that. because I, I do know that I, I travel by myself all the time. Well, not all the time, but quite a bit. And that's a confidence that people are surprised at, but it's like, oh no, I learned that because, because if you don't teach that skill, then their world becomes almost like their noose where, you know, it just closes in and closes in. But if it, yes. but if you teach them that they do have access to to the bigger world, then you give them a confidence that that they that they wouldn't have understood otherwise. I think. Yes, and one of the challenges of this job is the family. It's a lot of families. It's hard. It's hard when the child. You know, their, their child learns the skill. Oh, they can ride the bus. They can go here and there, you know. And it, it's hard for parents yeah. to to let go and encourage that independence. Um, that's that's one of the main challenges I think we're going to talk about later. So I apologize for getting ahead of myself. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, just, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's fun yeah. to see the students get independent um, and learn that they can do it for themselves and travel. Right, because that's uh, when I was the TVI, every parent I talked to, that's what I bumped up against. And I'm like, yes. okay, uh, I'll save that for, for when you start <laughs> to complain about it later. <laughs> but but it, but you're right. I mean, and so even now, um, every every visually impaired person that I've run up against, I'm like, well, you know, I have two masters in this and I've been doing this since 01. So I think I could help you. And, and I'm just shocked at how many people say, no, no, they're not, they're not interested. And it's like, I can't make it. I can't make your life how you were a day before you lost your vision. But if you tell me what your problem is, I can give you at least two or three solutions. And I'm still surprised. And they said, no, we're not interested. But again, you have to want something better for yourself. And orientation and mobility really is that skill set. And, and and I can see that now because, you know, I know you are very active. You, you know, horseback ride and you dance and you, you know, you exercise and you do all that. So I can see how that would be a role. Uh, it just fits in with your personality to do orientation and mobility. So how long did it take you again to get that degree? Uh, well, I think it took, it took two years and actually, um, I finished the O&M before the VI. So I did my internship at the Tennessee school for the blind, uh, for mm -hmm. eight weeks. And then I came down to San Antonio, Texas 
and I was at the San Antonio ISD in, uh, inner city school district. I did my teacher on the visually impaired, the TBI internship there. Uh, what great experiences. Because we also work with babies all the way up to age 22. So for O&M, for like babies, you're just trying to get them to move. Um, what's one of the challenges was when the baby has is multiply impaired, uh, if you can get them to even just reach for a toy, I mean, that's that's progress. That's success. Um, the mm-hmm. other, you know, depending on the impairment, uh, just to crawl towards a toy, to move, to walk, you know, pull self to standing. So we work a lot with, I work a lot with PTs, especially, um, and the BIs also. We do a lot of uh, collaboration um, mm-hmm. sessions together. Well, and I don't think people recognize how big of a role vision plays in kids learning things because they learn because they see it and then they can replicate it. But if they don't see it, it's really hard and you have to, you have to move them through those movements because they don't see it and think, Oh, I I should probably be doing that. I should be, you know, whatever. So, you know, that's a, that's a great thing to, you know, to think about also. So what are, what have been some of your successes in this field? For, for uh, professionally, I just, uh, I just had a few. Uh, one of my former students, the one from kindergarten, is now working at a restaurant. Um, I just uh, a friend of mine sent me her picture and said, "You remember so and so?" I'm like, "Of course." So she's working at a restaurant. I have another student that's going to college, and another one she's working up in San Antonio at another business up there. Um, just uh, just to hear these students like going to college or working is such a success. I. Uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, just something about that and you know to see, see that they they can do it and so that and that their family allowed them to <laughs> that's even better yeah well because I know that after I lost my vision and I decided that I could go back to school and I went back to school and so when I tell people well after I lost my vision I went back to school and I got three masters and they're like no and I'm like yeah it's really possible and you know, in schools, especially universities, they have, I don't want to say they have rules, but they have whole divisions in place, departments in place that will help you to be successful. They have to do to a college level thing, what a TVI does at an elementary or, you know, high school or whatever school, you know, public school level or whatever that is. So they're reciprocal, you know, when you, when you think about it and, and I guess, you know, people, parents selling their kids short is has always been very discouraging for me. And you mentioned it as well. So how do you help overcome that? Well, pray. <laughs> um, you know, I've got a lot of support in the high school like for my students, now that I'm taking to larger intersections and crossing, we're doing some local bus travel here, which is, we're in a small town. So we just have like a, a smaller bus system. And I did that before Christmas break and the parent was super happy. I'm taking another student to tra- um, San Antonio for a bus trip. They're very encouraging. I think we just start now, like uh, beginning of high school is when I'm taking them, that they can see it. Hopefully over three years, three more years, you know, of high school, mm-hmm. they see this growth. So I think just getting to it earlier uh, so parents can see they can do it um, and not waiting until they're almost graduated. Um, I just think that's probably the most we can do right now. And, and to show them other students, too, or other people with visual impairments that they can do this, too. So. Sometimes we watch some YouTube videos on different um, other people with visual impairments to show them what they can do. So, because because my thing is is I always was trying to discourage the parent and and I would say to them, if you don't let your child go into like a voc rehab or something or learn everything they can about their visual impairment then even if you put them in the fanciest room ever with all the the toys and stuff, it's still a jail cell. It's just decorated very well. And after you're gone and they watch other people's lives move forward, they're going to recognize that they've been gypped. 
and 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 no kid oh, almost almost no kid wants to put forth the work if they think they can get around it by not doing it but in the long run if you get them to understand the long ball the the, the long range goal you stand a bigger chance of getting yes. them to to want to, to buy into their future because when the parents would say, well, we'll just get them disability when they're 18. And I'm like, well, okay, now let's just pretend when you had your first job and you were paid $1.65 an hour, you're going to get that for the rest of your life. The government's not going to care if you learn any more skills or, you know, whatever. And once you get on that, it's very difficult to get off. And, and, and as a blind person, that does not negate all the positive things you can do and be, you just have to do it a little differently. But, but there's people like you out there that are, that are going to show them and care about them and guide them and, and offer them the possibilities that they were afraid to, to try. We try, we try to we try to share <laughs> and encourage the students to pursue a career or, um, you know, just to be more independent. And that's what they learned from me. They're probably thinking, oh, just take me on the bus again, you know. But some students, they're so excited to go because I saw uh, independence. I saw self-confidence, but especially a couple of students I took a couple of years ago. I saw the self-confidence when we got downtown and I asked a student to locate this business and they had to use my, my phone, my Google maps, and they had to locate this business. And they're like, wow, I did it. You know? So I think just by keeping students out there and exposing them to all these careers and um, areas where they could become more independent, I think that's what students need. Well, and showing them, you know, showing them early that they can be successful because, yes. and again, even, but let's be honest, even sighted students, they don't achieve what they could be doing. They, you know, they, so it's not just in, you know, children with visual impairments that sometimes don't, le you know, reach their potential, but, but they have a harder road to go because they have this thing and and let's be honest also sighted people they're like here let me just do that for you because it'd be faster because you know my thing is is I can do it I can do lots of things but it generally takes me you know almost twice or three times longer sometimes but I still get it accomplished and if speed was the issue then I might be deficient but since that's rarely a, a key factor I still get it done Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. So do you, do you still do anything with the Braille that, uh, that you learned in the beginning? Um, well, I still, okay. So I had a student with total blindness that was academic. And so I used the Braille. Um, I would make games up for her as part of my O&M lesson. And she really liked to do like riddles. And then she had a find and I did all in Braille. And then it would give a clue of what room she had to find because that was one of her goals is to locate room numbers. But then she always correct me on my braille too. <laughs> and I always tell her, oh, I'm just seeing if you can, if you can read my braille. <laughs> but um, she, would, she was good. She knew her braille. And so um, I used to use I for that. And sometimes I just do braille pictures just to keep up on my braille because I do remember it. I still got to use my cheat sheet, but I like the aspect too. I don't have my teaching degree, so I, I can't do um, the TVI here in Texas. Um, we move somewhere else, another state, maybe. Maybe I could take some type of test or something, but that's kind of what held me back from um, uh, pursuing the actual TVI job. So, Well, I know that when, when it, it, you know, if you do choose to move and go to Tennessee, that they they just require a praxis and so you'd be you'd be good to go there so <laughs> okay well i was going to contact you about that later <laughs> yeah okay so we'll talk yeah. about that off camera but yeah. but yeah i mean just um yeah the, the, the possibilities uh, get get much bigger for you but i really do appreciate this topic because this is something that is really 
close to my heart because it really, it really hurts my heart when I know visually impaired people and, and I have daily living skills as my bailiwick. So, you know, you need to do something in the kitchen. I can help you solve that. And to have people say, I don't think that'll work. And I'm like, but it does, it does just trust me. And, and you just see it on a bigger scale because these kids are, you know, they're, they're a lot younger and they have a lot, they have a lot longer to try and overcome what they feel I'm sure is a, is a detriment. And, and that's the other thing you have to get them not to have that mindset that this is the worst thing ever, that this is because I've done some very interesting things because of my blindness that I would never have done otherwise. Like I never would have met you, you know, cause we wouldn't have been in that program together, but you know, I, I don't, I, I see it as just a, a different opportunity. And if you can really sell the students on that and open up their mind to different challenges and changes, I, I think you've got half the battle won. Yeah. It's, and now in Texas, um, like any student that gets a, a functional vision evaluation is what the TBIs do to try the visually impaired, they automatically get an O&M orientation mobility evaluation, where back in 2013, so this became law in 2014. So before that, it was just the, the TBIs would decide, um, nope, that, that child does not need an O&M eval. And so some kids might have been missed, you know, or passed by for O and M. And so now since this law, we automatically do um an O and M eval for for students. So And I think that's really I think that's I think that's really warranted and I and I applaud the state for doing that because even watching the TVI stuff when they did the functional vision evaluation and uh, you know all those other things there were still lots of things that were uncovered and they're like, well, you know, we'll deal with that later. And so then they just kind of went by the wayside and it wasn't as robust as it needed to be. But, you know, then again, there's not, there's a a TBI job. They have a lot of responsibility and I think their, I think their uh, calendars fill up quickly with all the students and, you know, all the things that they have to do. Cause there is a lot of paperwork with TBI stuff. <laughs> yes, a lot. And now here they also have to do the expanded core curriculum. So that has to be addressed at every art or IEP meeting every year. And, um, you mm-hmm. know, self-determination, compensatory skills, your, your social skills and O&M is part of that, but there's a lot to address for the TBI <laughs> on top of, you know, your regular paperwork, your IEP meetings, you got to enter all your information in. So, uh, mm-hmm, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it's a busy job. That That's true. So yeah. it, in wrapping this up, is there anything else you want to add to our discussion that, because I invite you here and then I do most of the talking and another thing. You know? oh, you're doing okay. You're doing okay. No, I just, uh, <laughs> O&M is a great field. It's, uh, you know, it's such a small population for the VI. And so when I start somewhere, um, I like to, I always go to the districts. I introduce myself. I give them my business card and I always get to know all the secretaries and receptionists because they might only see me once a week, but I can get to know them. They'll know who I am instead of like, who are you? Do you come here? <laughs> you know, so I always try to introduce myself mm-hmm, and let people know mm-hmm. who I am. I've even gone into the community too. And I've talked to librarians and um, especially like um, sometimes the hospital at the reception desk and that. And I'll tell them who I am and why I might be bringing students there, what we'll be working on. That way they're not like, I don't know, you know, um, if they should be here. And yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> I've heard stories mm-hmm. of that too. But uh, yeah, I just get get our name out. I think they need to see students with long canes or monoculars using those devices. Um, our local ATB grocery store, I take students there and they use their monocular to read those vial signs because they'll ask them, you need to locate this, this, this. And, and so for people to see see students using our devices. It's awesome. 
So it's it's a wonderful profession. Yeah, I know that when I'm out in public and I have a cane, it's it's almost like it's people repellent. They don't know how to interact yeah. or and, and so when I first got down here, I I had some t-shirts made up and I called them chat wear and I had things printed on them so that people, if they read the shirt, oh. they would interact with me. And one of them said, did you see that question mark? Me neither. And it was supposed to be like an icebreaker. But I, I think that if you engage with enough people, and, and this is where I take my, my job seriously as a visually impaired person, I take my job personally that, the people I interact with see me act as professional as I can and and that I show a, a level of skills or, or whatever that I can interact with people and I don't put them off. I try to be as engaging and helpful. And, and with you going before those students and helping people understand what's going to come next or happen, I think that that's an excellent way to just continue to build um community and just understanding that they probably because because i'll ask people am i the first blind person you've ever met and if and if i'm on the phone with somebody i don't ever tell them i'm blind because that's because as a blind person i can still read write speak and listen and my blindness has no effect on any of those things but when you see me in person i need to put them at ease so that they don't feel like I don't know how to talk to her because I've also had the case where people will talk to whoever I'm with and pretend all of a sudden I'm deaf, you know, <laughs> Yeah, is little, yeah. which is a little I, they'll frustrating. Talk to me and I'll, they want me to talk to my student. I did have, okay, a couple of years ago, I'll tell you a story. Probably three years ago. I was on a bus trip and my student did not want to use a cane at the time. And so she had to locate the bus at the transit station. Well, when she got to the bus, the, I could tell the driver was getting impatient, but she didn't have a cane and she couldn't see the, what the driver was like nodding because she asked him a question and he didn't mm-hmm. come out and say, yes, this is the bus. He just kind of nodded. Well, I just kind of stood to the side and I thought, I'm going to see what she did. And yeah. Yeah. she just kind of stood there. But now if she would have had her cane, he would have said, Oh, yes, this is the right bus. You know, he would have understood why she was just standing there, you know, and just kind of waiting for him to verbally answer. So um, I encourage the use of a cane, especially um, especially when the kids are on the big intersections. Um, what else? I was going to tell you something else. I just forgot a second. Uh, if it comes back to me, I'll tell you. <laughs> but um uh, Oh, I always have kids introduce themselves too. Like when we go to the library, uh, some use an AAC device. It's an augmentative communication device, assistive or something. I can't remember the exact name, AAC, but it says hello and it has all the, you know, different prompts and that you push the button. It says hello for the student because they're nonverbal mm-hmm. students. Mm-hmm. So whenever we go to the library, I've been to the hospital, we go to ATB, the Walmart, I always have students introduce themselves and learn how to put their hand out for a shake and just to talk to the people um, that they have enough vision where even if they're just a couple of feet away, they can still see the the employee. So, yeah. Well, because I know that I had a friend of mine uh, braille a bunch of my grandson's books and, you know, so I could sit down and read them and it forced me to relearn my braille, which I had, you know, become very rusty at. And, and now my grandson, you know, cause when I, when I have my cane, it's like, well, honey, this is grandma's, you know, eyeballs on a stick. And, and, and he's very aware that I can't see and he's, and he's very helpful. And so I think as he grows up just with, having seen me, you know, for as long as I live, that I think you'll have a different view of people who have a visual impairment. And again, the more your students can get out in the real world and show them uh, a part of blindness that they didn't understand before, I think that that just helps the overall picture of what they're capable of. Yes. Yeah. I kind of got to, rewarding story. I have a student that's going to be showing pigs 
And uh, the parent was concerned because she had a hole that, I don't know what you call it, the, the stick or whatever that guides the pig. But anyway, they were concerned that she won't be able to hold hold that. And uh, she's been using a cane during uh, O&M. And so the nurse had told parent, I think she'll be just fine because she can hold a cane because we've been introducing it this, this school year to find those dropoffs. And uh, so anyway, she's going to be showing pigs. <laughs> at the local um, fair. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Any accomplishment. Yeah. I, I, you know, yeah. I, I agree that we really need to applaud those things. And I mean, cause I could, you know, I could talk for another 20 minutes about all the, the people I know that have visual impairments that have, have done great things. And, 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 you know, and again, the problem is, is, if you're visually impaired and you make a peanut butter sandwich, people clap like, Oh my gosh, that's the most amazing thing. Or, or they underestimate you or overestimate you. But again, it's up to the, the students and you as their teacher to help balance that all out. That it's not that spectacular. They made a peanut butter sandwich, but it's just part of normal living. But when they do something yeah. like, like you mentioned your student doing that, oh, okay, I guess, I guess all this is possible. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, anyway, sure this is. has been fabulous <laughs> fun. And again, I could talk for another 50 five minutes about you know blindness stuff because it is very interesting to me and it is something that I do uh still keep in touch with because every everybody I meet that has a visual impairment I'm like how many services have you had and what do you do and and so I tend to over overreach because they're not that interested <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway but thanks for this Patty I super appreciate it and um Thanks for anything final you want to say before I sign us off here? Uh, nope, I'm off to go watch Michigan play Washington football tonight for the national championship. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I'll be in contact later with you too. But thanks for inviting me here. I really appreciate it. Oh, Enjoy thank it. you. And um, that's it. That's it for this week on the Blind Zone, where curiosity brings its own reward. And now we have been curious about orientation and mobility and patty has definitely answered a lot of those questions so thank you for that and we'll see you next week on the blind zone